everyone, and welcome to another episode of Eyes on Earth. We're a podcast that focuses on our ever-changing planet and on the people here at Eros and across the globe who use remote sensing to monitor and study the health of Earth. I'm your host, John Holt. Satellite data and ground surveys can give us a pretty good idea of what kinds of plant life exist across the United States right now. That's what Landfire does through several of its GIS mapping products. But what if you wanted to know what kinds of plant life existed before the satellite era? Well, that's a trickier question, and it's one that Landfire has spent well over a decade working to answer through a product called Biophysical Settings, or BPS. BPS defines vegetation conditions prior to European settlement at Landsat satellite scale all across the United States. Determining those settings wasn't easy, though. It required input from more than 800 experts and multiple rounds of scientific review. Researchers with a Landfire partner called the Nature Conservancy recently released a paper that explains how that work was performed and how those baseline conditions help land managers and the scientific community understand the landscape, prioritize restoration projects, plan for fire response, and much, much more. Here with us to talk about this topic is lead author Corey Blankenship, a fire ecologist with the Nature Conservancy. Corey, welcome to Eyes on Earth. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, it's great to have you. We're always happy to have someone from the Nature Conservancy on the show, one of the partners of Landfire, partners with the Earth Resources Observation and Science Center. Let's start off our talk about biophysical settings. Let me just ask you, what does that mean in general? What does biophysical settings mean in the context of the Landfire program? What are we talking about here? Well, you gave a great definition, I think, when you started. It's essentially historical vegetation. It's a fancy name for what we think was on the landscape prior to colonization. So that's the idea of a biophysical setting. Landfire then takes that concept and does two things with it. First, we create a map. So we have a spatial representation of where all these historical vegetation types existed. And then the second part, the piece that we wrote about in our paper, is that we model those historical vegetation types or ecosystems. So we have a quantitative representation that describes the growth and change dynamics of those ecosystems over time. So you have the map itself and then you have sort of an explanation. Right. So you can see on the map where these things are located, and then you can learn more about it in the model. You know, how do these things function? How did they behave? How did they grow over time? And what were the drivers of change? I see. I see. So there are all the factors that sort of influence the way the vegetation changed or grew up, if you want to use that sort of like clunky analogy. Yeah, actually, it's not so clunky. When we talk about human populations, you can think about how a child, you know, develops over time. You have young children, they grow up to be teenagers, then adults, and then you have elderly. Well, vegetation changes in those same predictable ways. A forest might start with young seedlings and saplings. The trees will grow taller over time. Eventually, you'll have mature or what you might think of as adult trees on the landscape. And then finally, the older stages are those old growth forests. The models essentially quantify how long it takes to go through those stages. And then the second component, again, going back to the population dynamics sort of analogy with a population, you look at things like birth rates, migration, disease, all those drivers of change in a human population. Well, it's the same thing in an ecosystem. With ecosystems, we look at drivers of change like hurricanes, fires, insects and disease, so again, it's that growth and change over time in ecosystems, just like you look at with human populations. It sounds like it took a heck of a lot of work to pull these together. Tell us about the process. How did you find the answers to these questions? It sounds like there were a lot of collaborators and meetings and determinations, but obviously none of you could go back in time, you know, in a, a DeLorean or something and, and take a look. How did you figure this out? Well, I wish we could have done that. Uh, <laughs> but instead, what we did is we asked experts around the country to help us. This project started in the early 2000s with a prototype. And one of the things we learned right off the bat was that there really aren't enough data to help us build these ecosystem models. We're lacking information about how ecosystems function, essentially, which is why we need models, right? So we took a combination of experts as well as all the scientific data we could find, combine those into the models, and that's how we created the set of models that we had today. 
initially when we started this effort, we did kind of a road show in about a year. We went around the country and held 12 or 13 large meetings where we invited experts to bring their knowledge to help us build these models. And then from that point, over the last about 15 years, we've gone back and revisited the models and brought in more experts to help us and new literature to improve the models over time. At this point, we've had about 800 people contribute to the development and refinement of this model set. And we have over 900 models representing all the ecosystems across the United States. Wow, that's a lot of information and a lot of people. Now, forgive me if I'm getting too deep into the weeds here, but who are these people? I mean, do you just do you like put a, a piece of paper up in the student union or something with a phone number on it and said, do you know about the trees in 14... 14- 83 or something. How do you find these folks and where, what are the areas of expertise? Where are you pulling this knowledge from? We looked to people that would have the ecological knowledge necessary to build these models. So a lot of these people came from academia. We had a lot of experts from the Nature Conservancy. We drew heavily from the land management agencies in this country. So places like the Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management. Those are the people with the expertise. They're out on the ground and they have a lot of experience with how these ecosystems function. Even if it's not in published literature, There's a lot of knowledge about how ecosystems behave and change over time. And so those are the people we invited. I want to talk about a science term, state and transition modeling. First of all, can you explain what that is? And is that kind of what you were doing? Were you sort of working backwards? Yes. So when I say biophysical settings model or ecosystem model, technically what I'm talking about is this thing called a state and transition model. And what that does is it breaks down an ecosystem into its component parts. Those are the development stages, the young forest, the adult forest, the old growth forest. Those become the states and then the transitions are the things that drive change over time. And the models are quantitative. So each development stage has an age range associated with it. And there's a probability for each transition, like fire or hurricane. And so you can run the model out over time to get a sense of what the landscape may have looked like historically and how often these disturbances occurred. Okay. Okay. So so basically you're trying to figure out where it is and how it got there. And the, the transition is, is sort of how it got there and the state is kind of where it is. And you can map that either backwards or forwards, as I understand it. And you guys went backwards. That's right. And of course, land fire goes forwards as well. And they're modeling out changes to vegetation. Given the approach you had for this, it seems like you could have gone further or maybe not quite as far. Why a pre-European condition baseline for biophysical settings? Why not go back further or not quite as far? There's nothing magical about the pre-colonization time period that we chose, but there were a couple of reasons why we chose it. One is that it's an ecologically relevant time period. If you go too far back, you're getting into different climates that aren't relevant to management today. The second reason is that we had practical considerations. Even looking at pre-colonization, data are limited. We chose this time period because we felt like it was still ecologically relevant and there was still some science to to guide us on what the conditions looked like. Right. So the, there was actually some data that was collected that you could look at. That, that, that was a big factor. That's right. So a couple of the data sources that we use were things like fire histories. Fire histories actually look at the growth rings of trees. Each year, a tree records an annual ring. Some trees will record a fire when it passes through as a scar in that ring. And so you can see how old trees are, how fast they're growing, and how often fires occurred So that's one source of data that we have. The actual trees, the trees themselves. Exactly. And that is a great source of data in those forest types that record fires. So that's things like a ponderosa pine forest. Of course, that leaves out non-forest areas. But we have some other sources of data. One of those sources are the general land office surveys. Back when this country was expanding westward, the government set out to survey all the land and they did that in a rectangular grid pattern. So there was this regular grid and you had surveyors going across the landscape and they would take notes as they went. And so you have notes at regular intervals about what vegetation 
existed. And they would even note things like if a fire had passed through. And so we get clues to what the landscape looked like from those kind of data as well. They're not perfect, but we take all these sources together and that's how we develop this picture and these models of how the ecosystems functioned. So it's sort of a variety of different sources, some, as you say, kind of from the landscape, but also this grid system that was sort of mapped out has been useful to give you some clues as to which way you're going. That's right. We take any information that we can, whether it's fire history, old survey data, expert knowledge based on, you know, vegetation monitoring, all those things together give us information about how these ecosystems function. When we talk about BPS, are we talking about ideal conditions or is it just prior conditions? Is there a distinction and does that distinction matter? Well, let me offer a different term for you. Rather than ideal, I think we're talking about useful conditions. These are conditions that ecosystems evolved with and to which they are adapted. The reason that's useful is because it helps us to understand the conditions we see on the landscape today. And it also gives us insight into how these ecosystems behave and how they might change in the future. So let me give you an example. I live in Bend, Oregon, just a couple miles from the Great Deschutes National Forest, and the first vegetation type that you encounter is Ponderosa Pine Forest. Our models, the BPS models, as well as other data sources, tell us that these forests were dominated by large, old, widely spaced trees in the past. That doesn't mean that you wouldn't have areas with younger, maybe denser trees, but most of the landscape would have been in these large, open, old growth conditions. We know from our biophysical settings models, plus the last hundred years of fire suppression, what happens when fire is removed from the landscape. You get a denser and younger forest, especially as we're looking towards a drier, more fire prone future. The models can tell us what type of forest can handle that future. And again, it's those big open stands of large, widely spaced trees. And so it's that understanding that helps the Forest Service manage the forests around here. They're doing a lot of thinning and burning. And the idea is that they're making that forest more resilient to a future where we expect more fire. At the same time, there's actually a lot of benefit for people because they're decreasing risk of high severity fire in the community of Bend. I think that maybe some people will see pre-European conditions and think, well, is that what all land managers are trying to get back to? Is that what you're trying to say? And, And no, it's not really like that, is it? It's more just understanding what's on the landscape and what happens to it and what has happened to it and seeing if that's going to be relevant for the conditions on the ground today. That's right. It's about informing land management. And so getting back to that example of population dynamics for human communities, what you're looking at when you're trying to understand human population dynamics is you're trying to understand what your population looks like and plan for the needs of society over time. And land managers try to do the same thing and they use ecosystem models to help them do that. In some cases, restoration is a goal, and you can use the biophysical settings models as a target for what restoration might look like to quantify your goal, as well as to give you insight into the types of management actions that will help you restore an ecosystem. The second example, and this is what Landfair does with the biophysical settings models, is the models provide a baseline for measuring change over time. That can be used for things like prioritization, you know, Where do we want to allocate fuels money to reduce fire risk? Where do we want to invest conservation dollars in places that have relatively good vegetation condition? It almost sounds as though you're saying there isn't enough money and there aren't enough resources to do everything we want to do. How could that be? (laughs) That's exactly yeah, that's exactly right. There was a study out in California and they asked the question, can we thin our way out of this problem with high severity wildfire? Because we know if we thin the forest, we reduce the intensity of fires. And the answer was no. When you take into consideration all the constraints that are placed on federal lands, for example, you can't log in wilderness and you can't thin too far from a road and you can't thin too close to riparian areas. When you take into consideration all of those constraints, we can't thin our way out of the problem. 
Do the biophysical settings evolve as land fire evolves? If so, how does it evolve? Do the figures change? Do the settings change? And, and what does the future hold there? Well, theoretically, on the type of timescales that we're interested in, in terms of management, biophysical settings shouldn't change because the sites aren't changing. But we know that our maps and our models are not perfect. And that is why we've invested over the last 15 years plus in updating and refining these models. A really great example is when we started back in the early 2000s, we created a model of Appalachian pine oak forest. And at that time, we didn't have any fire history or very few fire history studies in the Appalachians. And so at that time, we estimated the fire frequency to be about 100 years. Well, in the intervening decade or more, there's been a lot of fire history work in that area. And when we went back and revised this model recently, we changed the fire frequency to every 13 years. So we went from 100 years to 13 years based on this new science and new information. We're still trying to represent that pre-colonization vegetation, but our understanding does change over time. Where would people find this stuff? Is this all available in map format somewhere? Yeah, like all Landfire products, the biophysical settings models are online at landfire.gov, and all the data are open and free to download. And you can actually map it out, too. There's like a semi-intuitive mapping tool, right? Right. So you can get the map of historical vegetation or biophysical settings as well as the models all online. We've been talking with Corey Blankenship of the Nature Conservancy about biophysical settings, vegetation dynamics, and how land fire helps us to understand and manage our nation's land resources. Corey, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. And thank you, listeners, for joining us as well. Be sure to drop in for the next episode of Eyes on Earth. You can find us on our website at usgs.gov slash eros. That's usgs.gov slash E-R-O-S. Or you can find our shows on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts. This podcast is a product of the U.S. Geological Survey, Department of Interior. <laughs>